All right. Okay. So uh, uh, let's have the last session of uh, this afternoon. It's a pleasure to have with us Neta Engelhardt. And she's going to talk about uh, recent progress in understanding the information paradox using holography. So please, Neta. Uh, thank you, Esperanza. And uh, thank you for organizing this conference and giving me a chance to speak. I would have really liked to visit Madrid in, uh, in the winter. And so I, I hope that uh, this will happen at some point in the future. But for now, it's nice to still have this virtual conference. Um, so today, as, uh, as, been, as advertised, I'm going to talk about the black hole information paradox, as, in, as I like to call it, in the age of holographic entanglement entropy, which is a tool in holography. It's really an entry in the holographic dictionary that, in my opinion, has ushered in a new era of progress in both in quantum gravity in general, but in the black hole information paradox in particular. So um, I will say one other thing, which is that I'm trying a new uh, new technology here. So if you, hopefully you can see me at the bottom of the screen. If my face is blocking some text and I don't realize it, just let me know and I'll move it. Uh, okay, so without further ado, let me begin with uh, not the 30,000 foot view, but really the 60,000 foot view of the, uh, the information paradox. So there's the uh, general expectation that uh, if we're working in a regime where space-time is weakly curved, the universe should be well described by weakly coupled quantum gravity, uh, what we call semi-classical gravity. We don't expect that uh, when space-time is weakly curved that we have to worry about non-perturbative quantum gravity effects. We expect that the predictions of uh, gravity and the predictions of quantum mechanics are uh, more or less separate from one another. Now, the 16,000 foot view of the information paradox is really that it's an apparent contradiction between the predictions of gravity and the prediction of quantum mechanics of unitarity at the event horizon of a black hole. Now, the reason that this is an apparent contradiction is that the event horizon is not a place where we expect non-perturbative quantum gravity to kick in. So if the event horizon were a regime where you have strong quantum gravity effects are always important, then it wouldn't be a paradox, right? We would just say, well, we don't expect that um, gravity and quantum mechanics separately can make predictions. We expect that there's a non-perturbative theory that unifies the two that describes this regime. And so the predictions of either one separately are immaterial. But of course, that's not the case. What happens is that the event horizon for say large black holes has very low space-time curvatures. Uh, I think that um, if my order of magnitude estimate is correct, then I think that the estimate of where the event horizon of M87 is would it would should have something like a curvature which is maybe one order of magnitude larger than the curvature around the sun. So these are not regimes where we really expect non-perturbative quantum gravity effects to kick in. And at the same time, we're getting so we're expecting that we can make predictions from gravity and from quantum field theory without having to worry about the two, uh, about the coupling between the two and the interactions between the two. And it the information paradox is something that tells us that's actually not how this works that there appears to be apparent an apparent contradiction, even in this regime where we don't expect non-perturbative quantum gravity to matter or to kick in. So um, here's a caricature of what you often see about the, uh, it's sort of the, the elevator pitch, the 10 second pitch of the information paradox. So you might have two observers who are entangled, Alice and Bob. Alice ends up inside the black hole, Alice crosses the event horizon and Bob doesn't. And so what happens is we have this entangled pair. And if the black hole evaporates, then one partner goes away altogether, just disappears from the universe. And what we seem to find is that we went from a pure state of Alice and Bob together to a mixed state of just Bob. And that is an indication that information is lost. So in particular, unitary evolution has to preserve information and in particular preserve entanglement. And, and I'll say more, I mean by that, a little more precisely in a little bit, but the basic idea here is that this is forbidden by unitarity. And so we have a, a contradiction between the prediction of gravity, which is that the black hole evaporates and, um, and what you get is a mixed state. And the prediction of, um, of quantum mechanics, which is that ev evolution of a closed quantum system, and we expect that the entire universe is a closed quantum system, uh, that that is unitary. So this is the basic uh, idea here. Now, uh, who wins, unitarity or, um, or gravity? Uh, now, we've never seen violations of unitarity. 
We've also never seen violations of general relativity. So a priori, it's not clear why we should pick one over the other. But of course, most of us subscribe to, not all of us, but most of us subscribe to unitarity as the, the, the thing that wins. My personal take on this is that information loss would be catastrophic. Uh, it would mean that the evolution of the entire universe is non-unitary, which another way of thinking about this is that the entire universe is an open system. And of course we don't expect, the entire universe is literally everything there is. So we don't expect that that is an open system. It, it's sometimes a failure of determinism. So this is my personal perspective on uh, one of the many reasons more and more philosophical level that unitarity is uh, far more appealing than its violation. Now, either way, the paradox is a problem with our way of thinking about, the pro about this, this issue. The black holes exist. There is a definitive answer whether information is lost or conserved, whether the process is unitary or not. Nature doesn't admit paradoxes. This is just our failure to describe what it's doing. And so that means that we can find the answer. And ultimately, the reason we work on this is not just to understand whether black hole evaporation is unitary or not, but because the information paradox has a lot that it can teach us about, uh, about quantum gravity. So of course, that, uh, assuming that we can learn about the resolution to the information paradox without first knowing everything there is to know about quantum gravity. So the basic idea here is uh, there's a problem. It appears already at the level of a regime where we expect we can control everything. And that this has a lot of potential for teaching us about quantum gravity in general. And with, uh, with that, let me move on to discussing very briefly. And again, this is just an overview. I'll get into more of the details momentarily. What is it that has changed in the past couple of years? So the past couple of years have seen in some sense a renaissance of the of progress, uh, of re renewal of ideas from um, the 80s and progress on the black hole information paradox. Thanks to the advent of the age of holographic entanglement entropy and our understanding of um, the holographic dictionary. So what was so different? Well, before 2019, which is when the really major progress started happening, the basic accepted idea in the community, although again, some people dissented, but I'm talking about the majority here, thought that perturbative, non-perturbative quantum gravity is just a necessary ingredient to see unitarity. In other words, most of us subscribe to the unitary evaporation of black holes, but to actually see this, actually see that information is conserved, it would be nece excuse me, necessary to actually have access to non-perturbative quantum gravity calculations. And in particular, the conventional wisdom was that semi-classical gravity, this uh, weakly coupled limit of uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, just looks like it's losing information. There is no way to see that information is conserved, no matter what kind of calculation you do in semi-classical gravity. But somehow quantum gravity fixes it up, maybe non-perturbative corrections add up somehow. So this was the conventional wisdom uh, back before 2019, and I know I certainly subscribe to this. Now, let me move my hands up a little bit. Um, now, what, what happened in 2019? Well, the new results from May 2019 that in some sense kickstarted this, uh, this new this renaissance is a result of two papers, one by Jeff Pennington, one by Ahmed al Hairi, myself, Don Merrill, and Henry Maxfield, which was, and, and this, these papers were really a semi, purely semi-classical analysis that actually showed a smoking gun signal of unitarity. And it's, uh, it, was, it was really surprising that we could see this, that we could just do a semi-classical analysis and see something which is associated very heavily with unitarity. And I would say that it's a safe bet, I think, to say that most of us thought that this type of calculation was just impossible. Of course, it was made possible by the, um, the beauty of holographic entanglement entropy, which is what I will be talking about for part of this talk. Uh, um, okay, so now let me get around. This was just the, basically the overview of where this is going and why it's exciting. The, to talk about the black hole information paradox right now, why this is so timely. So I'll set up the problem by talking about the, uh, the information paradox uh, before 2019, the way we thought about it then, just really the bare bones. And then rather than jumping straight to what the new developments are, I want, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the tools that were necessary, which is uh, the holographic entanglement entropy that I keep advertising. 
Then I'll talk about the information paradox uh, 2019 forwards. And I will speculate after that about where I think it's going next. So with no further ado, let's begin the story. And our story really begins, as most good stories do, with thermodynamics. So this is Wheeler's famous Gedanken experiment, which uh, relies on the insight, on the idea, the understanding that in classical general relativity, black holes have no hair, which is the fancy way of saying that black holes have no uh, microstates in classical GR. Of course, if something doesn't have microstates, then it doesn't have entropy. So you can do the following. You can take a cup of tea, a hot cup of tea, which obviously has entropy, and you throw it into the black hole. And you can decrease the entropy of the universe that way. And you can do that arbitrarily with just throwing galaxies and stars and any kind of matter you want into the black hole. And at this point, I'd like to bring up one of my favorite quotes in physics by Sir Arthur Eddington which is, if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Now, Wheeler would have much preferred that general relativity not collapse in deepest humiliation. So he sent one of his students, Jacob Eckenstein, to solve this problem. And whenever I think about this, and I think about the problems that I give my students, I come to the conclusion that I'm a little bit too easy on them. Uh, regardless, it turns out that Beckenstein uh, was up for the challenge, and he proposed the following resolution. He said, black holes actually really are thermal objects. They do have a temperature and they do have an entropy, but this thermodynamic entropy is not due to classical gravity microstates. It's due to quantum gravity microstates. And it is computed by the area of the event horizon over four GH bar. And of course the presence of the GH bar here is really a smoking gun signal of the fact that quantum gravity has something to do with this. So this was Bekenstein's idea of how to resolve the issue. And it's really critical that quantum gravity makes an appearance here. Now, move again. Um, now, for a black hole close to equilibrium, I should say, the, uh, the, this is important for later in the talk, the, 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 you can also associate a temperature to the black hole, which is inversely proportional to the black hole's mass. Now, I want to make to emphasize here that quantum corrections are quite important to the story. So this doesn't make sense as anything other than an analogy in classical general relativity, simply because objects with a temperature have to emit radiation. And black holes in classical GI are perfect absorbers. So we already see that quantum gravity microstates are important because we have the GH bar in the area uh, in, in the Bekenstein Hawking entropy term and because classical GR just doesn't allow black holes to have entropy, I just want to drive this point home. And in fact, to actually calculate the temperature of the black hole, which Hawking did, you have to work in perturbative quantum gravity, not in general relativity. When I, and when I say perturbative quantum gravity, what I mean is the perturbative in the GH bar expansion. So you use GH bar as a small parameter and you expand around some classical background. So the idea is that you have some classical metric, you have some quantum fields propagating on it, and then you basically take those quantum fields, you plug them into the semi-classical Einstein equation, you compute the first order correction to the metric due to these quantum fields contributing to the stress tensor, then you find the new metric and you basically iteratively do this procedure. This, this, is, uh, this gives you an idea of what the perturbative quantum gravity uh, looks like in the limit where GH bar is very small. So let's talk a little bit about black hole thermodynamics and the black hole radiation. So if we, we take Bekenstein's idea and Hawking's realization of it, and we say the black holes are truly thermal. And if that's the case, then they should radiate. And so if the temperature of the black hole is hotter than its ambient surroundings, then as it radiates, it's going to shrink in size and lose mass. But because temperature is inversely proportional to mass, as the black hole evaporates, it's gonna get hotter. So it doesn't stop evaporating until it gets, keeps on getting hotter and hotter until it disappears altogether. And of course, Hawking's 1975 paper was entitled Evaporating Black Holes, but rather was titled Black Hole Explosions uh, for this reason. Now, a few numbers just to ground us. So large black holes are very cold. Sagittarius A star, for example, with current estimates of its size, has a temperature of about 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. Now a solar mass black hole would have a temperature of about 10 to the minus eight Kelvin. A lunar mass black hole 
would be at equilibrium with the cosmic microwave background. And finally, a coronavirus-sized black hole would be approximately at room temperature, which is probably something that some conspiracy theorists out there would be very interested in. So hopefully they're not watching this talk. Okay, so a few words about collapsing black holes before we move on to evaporating black holes. So here I'm drawing a picture of a star as it collapses in time. So we start out with the, um, right here, I guess I can kind of point at it the other way. Okay, there we go. Um, so we start out here at t equals zero. And we, so here this, you have some star and its radius shrinks as you fall forwards in time until eventually you have an event horizon forming. And then as you keep on moving forwards in time, it's going to uh, keep on collapsing until it forms a singularity. That's this, uh, this jagged line right here, right there. Um, so, this is, so this is the basic diagram for, an evap for a collapsing black hole. Now, what about an evaporating black hole? So here we have an example of, see, we have some EPR pair that uh, starts out over here at, uh, at, at early times, right there <laughs> at early times. Um, and now the two, so they have these two EPR pairs, they, you know, they go off in two different directions. This one of these is the Hawking, one of these is goes into the black hole, the other is the Hawking radiation. I'll say a few more words about this momentarily. As, as we evolve forwards with time, the event horizon get, area gets smaller and smaller until eventually the black hole completely evaporates and uh, during an explosion here to denote the final state, final stage evaporation. So what is the basic idea? Um, just a few words about this. So the basic idea is that you start out with the vacuum state at, um, at scry minus, so the past infinity. And you assume that the state at the future event horizon is non-singular, this is Hawking's calculation. And then you do a heroic number of Bogoliubov transformations, and you find that the state at future infinity is thermal with, uh, with this temperature. This temperature is for partial black holes, but essentially you find that the state at, at future infinity has a thermal spectrum. So this is the, the basic idea behind the calculation. Now, so what, now, now we have talked about evaporating black holes, so what's the paradox? So the paradox is what appears to be information loss between the initial state and the post-evaporation state. Although I should say that you actually get a paradox already halfway, a little over halfway through the evaporation process. So what's, uh, what, what's going on? Um, let me say a few words before we go on to the next slide. We start out with, um, maybe let me go to this picture. We start out with the vacuum state at past infinity. And we end up with the thermal state at future infinity. Now, the, pure, the, the vacuum state is a pure state and the thermal state is, is a mixed state. So we actually end up evolving from a pure state to a mixed state, which is a violation of unitarity. Now, how, what are the best ways of diagnosing this violation of unitarity? Uh, one way of, of doing that is looking at the von Neumann entropy. So the von Neumann entropy of a density matrix rho is defined as minus trace rho log rho. And one of the reasons that it's so valuable for us to, uh, for us to use in, this, uh, in, in diagnosing violations of unitarity is that for one, it's invariant under unitary evolution. If the state rho evolves unitarily, then the von Neumann entropy is, uh, is invariant, does not change. It vanishes for a pure state and only for a pure state. And finally, it's bounded from above by the thermal entropy. So for example, one of the ways in which we can sort of try to conceptualize information loss is via this very rough intuition that uh, we can quantify the information in a state in terms of the difference between the thermal entropy and the von Neumann entropy. So the thermal state is sort of this equilibrium state. It essentially has no information content. So if a system evolves to progressively larger von Neumann entropy, so it starts out at some value which is less than the thermal value and progresses to a value which is getting progressively closer to the thermal value, then we say that information is lost because we're getting closer and closer to the thermal state. And so that this difference above is getting progressively smaller. Now, of course, they might complain that this happens all the time. An open system is going to interact with its surroundings and it'll settle down to a thermal state and it will lose information along the way. And that's because open systems don't evolve unitarily. Now, the point though, is that the entire universe is not an open system. So we don't expect to see something like this for the entire universe. 
And yet, at the same time, Hawking's calculation shows that the entire universe evolves from a pure state to a mixed, to a thermal state, which is a mixed state, so that the von Neumann entropy of the entire universe grows as a function of time. So in this, uh, in, in a very simplistic model of an EPR pair, so this is the situation where which I, uh, I drew before, maybe let me go back up, I guess Alice and Bob case or um, this over here. So here we have an EPR pair that uh, straddles the event horizon. This is the idealization. Uh, I have an EPR that's straddles, the pair that straddles the event horizon. And so it's an EPR pair, it's together the two particles are pure and they're maximally mixed with one another. One falls into the black hole, one stays outside the black hole. And what happens is that the, um, the one particle, the particle that, that, that fell in, is, uh, ends up disappearing from the system because the black hole evaporates. And so we end up with just one of the remaining particles and its entropy is going to, so the entropy of the EPR pair goes from zero when they were in a pure state together, when both existed and to, it goes to something that's not zero log two after the entire system has finished evaporating because we're left with just one particle. So Alice and Bob, we're left just with Bob. Bob is in a mixed state and for an EPR pair, the entropy happens to be log two. So in this idealization of the, um, of the black hole evaporation process and Hawking radiation, this entropy is clearly increasing. And so this system does not look like it's evaporating unitarily. So what the basic idea here behind Hawking's calculation is that we can imagine forming a black hole from a pure state and computing the entropy of the Hawking radiation at every stage. What do we mean by that? We mean computing the entropy of everything that's outside of the black hole. Now, initially, this is zero. Where everything is in a pure state, the, the entire system is zero. Now, as the black hole starts to evaporate, now we are looking at two subsystems. We have the black hole and everything outside the black hole. So during, in, in mid stages of the evaporation process, the black hole and everything outside the black hole are two open systems. That means that the entropy of either one can and it does increase as a function of time. It can change in particular. So the entropy begins increasing. Now, again, as I mentioned, that's okay. We have two interacting systems, the radiation and the black hole. So because they're interacting, they're open, the entropy of either one of them can increase even if the entire system, the union of the two is evolving unitarily. Now, as the black hole continues to evaporate, Hawking's calculation shows that the radiation entropy keeps on increasing so that eventually it settles down to a thermal state. And this here is the thermal value. The problem is that after the black hole has finished evaporating, the, 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 the radiation is literally everything there is. So now there is no event horizon and the radiation is the entire system. So it's no longer the case that we are compute by computing the entropy of the radiation, we're computing the entropy of an open system. Now we're computing the entropy of the entire universe and that just happens to be all the all radiation which means that if the radiation does not have zero entropy after the black hole finishes evaporating, then the state of the entire universe went from being pure to being mixed. And so the universe evolves from a pure state to a thermal state and it loses information and therefore it could not have been evolving unitarily. So here is a, a, a diagram of what's uh, here uh, of what uh, what stages we're looking at as far as the evaporation process. So here, this is uh, this, this this initial slice right here. This is T before. This is when you just have a star. There's no event horizon. So the entropy that you're computing, the the state rho is the state of the entire system, and it's pure. Then you have some uh, middle state. That's the one right right here. Um, this middle state is one where you have the radiation and the black hole. So the entropy of either one can increase. Now the top, uh, the top over here, this, uh, this thermal state here, this is what's left at the end. So at, at the end, this is the radiation is all there is. Again, the event horizon is empty. And, uh, and that means that we should be getting the same entropy as we got at T before over here, but we're not, which means that we are still seeing something that looks like uh, information loss. So uh, I guess I'm really belaboring the point here, but it looks like we have a closed system 
that evolves from a pure state to a mixed state. And so it looks like we have information loss. And the, the question that you immediately ask then is whether or not quantum gravity is in fact non-unitary. There are any corrections that maybe only come in perturbatively, somehow save the day. Uh, what does a unitary entropy curve look like? So here's a unitary entropy curve. You start out with zero entropy. The two systems then eventually, you know, the event horizon forms, um, you have some radiation. While the radiation is a subset of the system and less than half of it, its entropy increases. When the radiation starts to contain more than half the system, they, it begins to purify itself. And so the entropy begins to decrease. And eventually the entropy of the radiation goes back down to zero. So that when the radiation is the entire universe, we, the entropy is exactly zero. So we have evolved from a pure state through some process where now we, we were computing the entropy of one of the subsystems until that subsystem was the entire system and its entropy is once again zero. So this would be the entropy curve for the radiation for a unitarily evolving quantum gravity system. Now, which is the correct curve for quantum gravity? Uh, as I mentioned before, most of us subscribe to unitarity. So we think that the page curve, this, uh, this, uh, this blue curve is the page curve. That's what it should look like. But then there's the question, of course, the burden is on us to compute this and to show that this is what it actually is. And to do this, we need to borrow from a new set of tools from holographic entanglement entropy. Do, do you mind if I ask a small question? Go for it. Um, in each of those time slices, I guess uh, we're assuming we have some kind of Hilbert space that describes the potential states of the system. Is there any reason to assume that the Hilbert space is always the same at every time slice? Um, so you don't have to do this at every time slice. You can just look at the, I mean, you can look at the S matrix if you like. Um, just look at what's happening. If you don't like the, if you don't, you don't want to worry about what happens in the middle, just look at the initial state and the final state. So as long as you're willing to accept the idea that there is a, some, some S matrix that you can compute and uh, that, that uh, there's some Hilbert space that you can, uh, you know, you can talk about states, then all you have to do is look at past infinity and future infinity. And you'd find that past infinity, if past infinity is pure, has a pure state, then future infinity does not. So you don't need to do this calculation. Um, if you, I mean, there are certainly reasons to believe, and I'll, uh, I'll say those momentarily in, in terms of ads -CFT, that we do have a Hilbert space at every stage of the game. But even if you don't want to accept that, all you have to do is ask about the initial and final states. I see. I guess I was wondering if the topology may change the Hilbert space in such a way so that um, at, at one point in time, you it's impossible to have unitary evolution, for example. At, like uh, well, stage. Right, so this would be subscribing to the idea of, uh, of information loss. If you can't have unitary evolution, then you have information loss. And certainly you could imagine having various topology changes, maybe a baby universe splits off. Uh, that, would be, that, would, that would be relevant for information loss. Uh, that would suggest, though, that evolution by a quantum gravity is in some sense non-unitary, is, is in some sense non-deterministic, because if you can't have unitary evolution, then again, there's a sense that your universe behaves like an open system and stuff can kind of come in or go out and you lose sense of predictivity. Now, again, this is a, a sort of philosophical argument, whether you want to subscribe to information loss or information conservation except that I'm going to give you one example of quantum gravity, which is the ads -CFT correspondence, in which information is conserved, in which there is a Hilbert space associated to everything, and in which you can actually do a semi-classical calculation to see the unitary page curve. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right, let me move on down. Um, Okay, so uh, I guess I've mentioned ads -CFT a lot, so it's time to, to move on to that. But I want to give a, uh, a, a preview a little bit of where we're going with this and why we, why we want to use ads -CFT for this. Although, uh, thanks to the previous question, you might already have an idea. So from the perspective of perturbative quantum gravity, if we're just working with weakly coupled uh, quantum field theory and uh, general relativity, it's very hard to see where Hawking's analysis goes wrong. And it seems like we might need to borrow an ingredient from non-perturbative quantum gravity, as strange as that might seem, given that it shouldn't have an impact at the event horizon, uh, to help us figure this out. Now, what, what did we find in the new developments? And we found that actually you can do a completely semi-classical calculation just within perturbative quantum gravity. 
and get the unitary page curve, but only if we can use an interpretation of that calculation, which is inherited from quantum gravity. And I realize this sounds a little bit funny right now, but I'm going to make it very clear what I mean by that. And to begin with, what do I mean by, uh, not interpretive, by, by inherited from quantum gravity? I mean inherited from holography, from the ads CFT correspondence. So uh, I'm sure most, if not all of you, have seen this slide ad nauseum or some version of it to many people's different talks. I'll be very brief here. So the ads CFT correspondence, aka holography, is the statement that quantum gravity with ADS boundary conditions, so essentially quantum gravity in a box, we call this the bulk, is dual to a lower dimensional non-gravitational quantum field theory. The boundary, also call it the CFT, because it's actually a conformal field theory. And here is the caricature that you often see. You have the soup cam. You have a D plus one dimensional string theory with, with or maybe M theory with ADS boundary conditions. And we have D-dimensional gauge theory. We call it the boundary. It doesn't actually live on the asymptotic boundary. It lives on a, on a manifold, which is conformally identical to it. So it's not actually, they're not physically living in the same space. Now, why is this so valuable to us? Well, one of the statements of holography, which is, uh, I think we, we sort of have gotten used to it and we're not as surprised by it now, but when you think about it, it's really fundamental, is that a black hole is just another quantum system. So a black hole in ADS, so this is a gravitational, quantum gravitational phenomenon in ADS, is just an ordinary non-gravitational quantum system in one fewer dimensions. And so this is a beautiful picture, uh, which is certainly not mine, of, of the, you know, they have the black hole in the bulk and you have some hologram on the boundary. But the boundary theory, the CFT, it is non-gravitational. It's a non-gravitational isolated quantum system. And in certain cases, we know exactly what it is, like n equals four super yang wheels. And it doesn't have an information loss problem. They, these systems evolve unitarily. They have a well-behaved, uh, well-defined Hilbert space. And we understand them, well, to an extent. So that tells us that if black holes are just non-gravitational quantum states of these nice non-gravitational quantum field theories, then black holes have to evolve unitarily. So that means that the answer to the information paradox, at least for quantum gravity in a box, is that information is conserved. So does that mean we're done? Is it time to you know, sing, celebrate, sing pains? I don't know, um, not, not really. And the reason that it's not quite enough is that this is a, a sort of a roundabout way of telling us what the answer is. But what we want to do at the end of the day is to actually do a quantum gravity calculation to see information conservation, to see unitarity. This tells us that it, the evolution is unitary. It doesn't tell us how to get there in quantum gravity language. So we want to understand exactly what the gravitational mechanism is that allows information to escape. So what's the idea? So here I've drawn two pictures, what's happening in the bulk, what's happening in the, on the boundary, on the back of the soup can. So we can talk about uh, states, early time or early stage states, and mid and late. So in the bulk, it looks like we have um, T before is a pure state, T during would compute the entropy of the radiation, it's something mixed, and then T after looks like it's mixed if we do Hawking's calculation. Now on the boundary, there's unitary evolution. So a row boundary of T before, T during, and T after, this is all unitary, they're all unitarily related. So here we have these two pictures, they're supposed to be identical to one another, they're dual, they're two sides of the same coin, one is giving us one answer and the other is giving us another answer. Of course, the CFT it really encodes full non-perturbative quantum gravity. So we trust that answer, but we want to understand how to work with the left side and get the answer that the right side is giving us. So the idea here is that instead of using minus trace row bulk, log row bulk, here row bulk is the state of the quantum fields in the bulk outside of the event horizon. Instead of using this formula, this definition of the von Neumann entropy for the bulk, is that we want to use the holographic prescription. So in other words, we want to use the prescription in the bulk for computing minus trace boundary, log row boundary. So this quantity, this the second quantity, we know is unitary. This is the correct evolution of the full state. And we somehow know that that's not encoded in the, in the first one but we do have a holographic prescription for computing it. And that, if it works, would give us a quantum gravity way of computing this entropy, which evolves unitarily. 
So again, since the boundary entropy evolves unitarily, this would give us a way of doing just purely semi-classical perturbative quantum gravity calculation for a unitary entropy. And I, 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 I present it now in hindsight, knowing that it works, but at the time it was really remarkable that it does. We were expecting to run into some issues because we were expecting that you need to do a non-perturbative quantum gravity calculation in order to see this, that somehow we would, we would fail, this holographic prescription would fail to give us the right answer because it's missing something. But remarkably, it, it's not. It really, it gave, actually gave us the correct answer. So what is this holographic prescription? So the von Neumann entropy of a density matrix on the boundary, so density matrix of state on the boundary, with, that has a bulk dual. So here we're talking, we take a holographic uh, quantum field theory, and we want to compute the entropy of a state of that quantum field theory that has a dual bulk that's well described by perturbative quantum gravity, at least in some regime. Really, you could talk about non-perturbative quantum gravity, but I'm not going to go there. Is given by this uh, formula called the quantum extremal surface form formula by uh, that by Aaron Wall and I proposed in 2014, which is that the von Neumann entropy of a boundary state is given by the area of a surface chi over 4 g eight bar. So this looks a lot like the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy plus the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields out, outside of that surface. This, the, the, the sum of these two is called the generalized entropy of the surface chi. So here if you see above right here. Um, so here we have, this is meant to be a Cauchy slice of the space time right here, this blue thing. And, um, and you have a surface chi, which is green. This, I'll say a few more words about it in a moment. So you take some, some slice of the space time, you look at the surface chi and you compute its area and you compute the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields outside of that surface. So in the blue, in the shaded blue region here. Now, of course you don't do this just for any surface chi, there's a special surface chi, which we call it quantum extremal. Now the, the intuition behind what this surface is, is that it's a, it's a saddle point of this generalized entropy functional. So in other words, if you were to slightly deform the location of chi, maybe a little bit to the left, or a little bit to the right, basically slight surface deformations of this thing would, uh, would not change the generalized entropy to leading order in the deformation. That's what we mean for this to be a saddle point of this, uh, of this generalized entropy. So this is the prescription. The, it was a proposal um, for computing the entropy of the, um, of, of the boundary when you have perturbative quantum gravity in the bulk, when in a regime where the space-time curvatures are, uh, are small. And so you would expect that you, you can have a non-perturbative, you have perturbative quantum gravity described in the system very accurately. So this is the tool. This is the, the main upshot of this part of the talk. And finally, I, 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 uh, I get around to talking about what, what, are, what were the new things that we did. So we considered an evaporating ADS black hole. And in, in principle, um, black holes in ADS actually don't evaporate. So this was the first problem we had to contend with because ADS is like a box. The so radiation actually bounces up and just comes right back in. Uh, unless you have a very, very small ADS black hole, but we don't really understand those very well. So, um, so we wanted to force a large ADS black hole to evaporate. And the way we did this was essentially by replacing the sides of the box, one of the sides of the box with a cold bath. So this meant that rather than the radiation just bouncing and going back in, the radiation would be sort of getting suctioned off into this cold reservoir. So this allows us to evaporate a large ADS black hole to even have the setup that we wanted in the first place. Uh, so then we basically just use the quantum extremal surface prescription to compute the entropy. So at early times, if you look at a, well, well we, we look at the two-sided black holes, Jeff Pennington looked at one-sided black holes for purposes of this talk, it's easier to, uh, to think just about one-sided black holes. So initially for one-sided black hole, the quantum extremal surface is actually the empty set which means that the entropy of the boundary as given by this prescription is given by the area of the empty set plus the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields on this, uh, on this slice uh, right, right here. Um, so this is, this was the initial stage. Now, as the black hole evaporates into this external reservoir, the von Neumann entropy of rho all of this quantum fields um, outside of the event horizon ends up uh, keep going for up and up and up. It keeps on increasing. 
eventually something very interesting happens, which is not something that, uh, that we anticipated, which is that a quantum extremal surface whose generalized entropy is smaller than the entropy of the empty set um, just nucleates at uh, right around the time when the page curve is supposed to turn over. So remember the page curve goes up and then it comes back down. The, at, right around the time when the page curve is supposed to turn over, we have a new quantum extremal surface that nucleates. And by nucleus, I mean, it just it appears. Um, and it has a generalized entropy, which is smaller than the generalized entropy of the empty set. So what, so here is the, so I've drawn it, this is the surface chi, I've drawn it in two different pictures here, uh, this one and this one behind me. Um, it's just, it sits just slightly inside of the event horizon. And as we evolve, and so now the, there's a jump in the quantum extremal surface prescription. Before it was given by the empty set, and now the entropy is given by the area of the surface chi over a 4GH bar, plus the entropy of quantum fields outside of it. And remarkably, it turns out that the entropy of chi, this generalized entropy of chi, actually decreases as we evolve forwards in time, which means that as we go up to, up to the page curve, so I'll go along, along the page curve, we go up until the, the turnover moment, uh, that's given by the entropy of, uh, of, of essentially the empty surface. And then as we go back down, as we, as we switch over to this new quantum extremal surface, the entropy starts to decrease again. And that gives us, as we would expect, a unitary page curve that first increases and then decreases. And so here we, we recover this, uh, this unitary page curve, which we were able to calculate, except for maybe this, this last bit at the end here, which we didn't actually calculate the, the very evaporation point itself. But everywhere where semi-classical gravity was valid, we're able to do this computation of a unitary page curve using only semi-classical physics. Now, I should say this really with an asterisk because we use semi-classical physics, but the justification behind this was not semi-classical. So let's take a step back and ask what really happened here. We use this formula, which only contains semi-classical things like areas which we can compute leading order behavior in GH bar, um, entropy of quantum fields on a curved background. All of these are things that we can compute from semi-classical gravity, and, and we did. And yet, at the same time, the sum of these two things, when we compute them for this particular surface chi, calculates a unitarily evolving entropy. So the contribution from chi, the fact that there's a switchover between the uh, classical, between the quantum extremal surfaces, the empty set, and this new non-empty quantum extremal surface, it saves the day. That's what allows us to compute a unitary page curve. Now, but the only place where non-perturbative quantum gravity appeared at all is in the interpretation of the generalized entropy of chi as the entropy of the radiation. That's the only place where we use quantum gravity, non-perturbative quantum gravity. Everything else was semi-classical. And so let me just pause here and emphasize that we've, we've learned something really, really fascinating here, which is that if quantum grav, as long as quantum gravity gives us this formula, then we get unitarity at the semi-classical level, which means that we really should be asking why is quantum gravity giving us this quantum extremal surface formula? Why does this work? Why does quantum gravity repackage entropy in terms of quantum extremal surfaces? And what microscopic Planckian physics is responsible for the success of the quantum extremal surface prescription? in reproducing unitarity. And so I'm going to spend the last few minutes of this talk, which Esperanza let me know if I'm starting to run really over time. No, um, I still you have uh, almost 20 minutes. Oh, okay, quarter great. So a quarter of an hour. Oh, okay, perfect. So I'll definitely finish, uh, I think right on time. So these, these questions are obviously extremely important. And I want to actually emphasize that um, this is, exactly what we had hoped from uh, getting a better understanding of the information paradox. We made a huge amount of progress in reproducing the unitary page curve. And in turn, that leads us to asking more questions that are better targeted towards teaching us about quantum gravity rather than just about the information paradox. So of course, these questions were asked pretty much as soon as, the, as we wrote those papers in May 2019. And there has certainly been progress on this front. So how do we generally compute entropies? I mean, we want to justify 
this computation of the entropy using quantum extremal surfaces. So how do we generally compute von Neumann entropies? Well, in, not, in a non-gravitational theory, we can compute the von Neumann entropy using the so-called replica trick. So here you introduce um, n replicas of the system, and you glue them in a, in a certain in a particular way, and you compute this, uh, this equation here, and then you take the limit as n goes to 1. So again, rho to the n here is the state rho on n independent copies, so-called replicas, of this non-gravitational theory. So this is uh, this is pretty standard. This is there's nothing no no quantum gravity involved with this state. Now, so for example, um, well, okay. So now now if we wanted to then in, start thinking about this in the gravitational setting, maybe um, I think there's a missing slide here that I can't find. Okay, um, let me I'll just say in words. Um, so that there is also a gravitational interpretation of this uh, of this formula. So how do we how do we interpret that and, and what, how do we how do we do that? Well, okay. So the way that we that we are doing this, we can uh, we can basically take similar number like n, n copies of the gravitational theory and work in Euclidean signature and attempt to compute the the von Neumann entropy in this exact same way. So essentially, that means that we introduce copies two copies of the boundary conditions. So we have two copies of the system, we have two copies of the boundary conditions, and we solve for the gravitational system that fills this in. And unfortunately, again, there's a missing slide. I'm going to do my best to fill it in. Um, so what ends up happening here is that there are actually two competing saddles. So again, let me just, just briefly say um, a couple of more words here. So the way that this is this is roughly done, since so this is a missing slide here, is that we take we, we take row to the n. We change it to the partition function. This is something you can rewrite rho in terms of the partition function on n boundaries. Uh, this is something that you can do in Euclidean signature very easily. And then you say, okay, I'm looking for the partition function of this uh, of the non-gravitational system if you're working in the CFT, or of the quantum gravity system if you're working in quantum gravity. And what you end up doing with that is you turn that into the gravitational path integral on n copies of the boundary. So this is where this is coming from. We want to compute the partition function for, say, two copies of the asymptotic boundary, which means that if we're working in Euclidean signature with ADS boundary conditions, then it just basically looks like two circles. And you, uh, as you ask, you know, what, what are the, how do we fill these in? Um, and so what ends up happening is that there are really, there are actually two competing saddles. There is a possibility of filling in this with two disconnected geometries. That's the thing on the left here. And one possibility for filling it in with a single connected, uh, single connected geometry. It's like a trumpet. Now, this is uh, this is this is in terms of contributions to the partition function, which we like to think of in terms of the gravitational path integral. I have a few more words to say about that momentarily. But what I want to say here really is that the upshot is that the quantum extremal surface formula and its generalization to the radiation. This can be computed directly from the gravitational path integral in this way. So in other words, you compute the gravitational path integral on n copies of the system, take the limit as n goes to one. And it turns out that the jump into quantum extremal surface occurs due to a switchover in the dominating saddles in the gravitational path integral. So that you, have, you start out before the turnover in the page time, when you're looking at the empty quantum extremal surface, you have this disconnected, two disconnected topologies that dominate the gravitational path integral. And after you, after you make the jump, when the new quantum extremal surface is dominating, you end up with this connected topology, which is behind me, um, which is the one that gives you unitarity, the turnover in the page curve. So this is the sort of path integral justification for that formula. Now, should we include these topologies in the gravitational path integral? Well, the fact that there is that we're trying to include connected Euclidean wormholes in the gravitational path integral ends up giving us non-trivial correlations between n boundaries. And this is problematic because these n boundaries, remember we have these are we have CF and CFTs. Uh, these are actually the CFTs that are completely independent of one another. These are remember, these are these n replicated copies which are identical and independent. And if they're identical and independent, then you would expect that they would factorize. But having these correlations between n independent copies of the same system doesn't seem possible. 
So you know, these are n independent copies. They shouldn't be correlated with one another. And so that, but in particular, that means that the path integral, the gravitational path integral, that's what I mean here by curly p, on the boundary on the manifold b to the n, b here is the asymptotic boundary, is not equal to the gravitational path integral raised to the power n. So that is n copies of the gravitational path integral in a single component of the asymptotic boundary. This the the right-hand side here is dominated purely by disconnected topologies or only receives contributions from disconnected topologies. And the left-hand side receives contributions also from connected topologies. So the conventional wisdom in ADS-CFT has always been that the gravitational path integral computes the partition function in the CFT. And so that is telling us that if this is true, then the partition function of n independent copies does not factorize. And that seems to be impossible for a single quantum system. These are n independent copies of the same system. This, this is not possible in the single quantum theory. So we, we have to question um, something here. Something here is not working 100% if we're allowed to include these connected topologies. Now, some possibilities for what's going on here. One possibility is that the gravitational path integral does not compute the partition function exactly, but actually computes an ensemble average over, so basically you do an average over partition functions of instances of an ensemble. Another possibility is that you have non-perturbative corrections that restore factorization. So this is another option. A third possibility, the gravitational path integral is a really good tool for computing self-averaging quantities in a single theory. So there are many possibilities here for what is going on and why we're allowed to include these this connected topologies in the gravitational path integral. And I want to emphasize that we never would have thought that we should include them. We never would have thought that they are important if it weren't for the fact that they give us unitary, that these are an explicit way of computing the quantum extremals for surface prescription, then justifying it directly from the gravitational path integral. So in, in what we've done here is we've, that we've taken a prescription in ADS-CFT, we've computed unitarity, a smoking gun signal of unitarity, the page curve in, um, in holography for the evaporating black hole. So this is the result of the major problem, longstanding problem in the black hole information paradox. But the, but the value of what we've learned here is in that it's taught us so much more about quantum gravity. It's taught us that there, the gravitational path integral is computing something novel or that it's really just, it's a tool for computing certain things, which, which we have to ask, you know, why is it a tool, a good tool in some cases and not a good tool in others? Uh, and, so, and, and so it's given us an idea of where is it that we need to go next as far as using the information paradox and these insights into understanding quantum gravity better. Which leads me to my uh, more speculative piece here on where I think we should be going with this. So we do have examples where we have some understanding of what's going on and what the gravitational path integral is computing. And the example that we really understand or understand best is two-dimensional dilaton gravity. And in that case, it looks like the gravitational path integral is genuinely computing a disorder average, an average over theories. It's doing an ensemble average. And that is what resolves the, that is what allows us to include this disconnected, this, this, the connected topologies. I should say that analogous phenomena actually appear in spin glasses where you have uh, similar correlated replicas and um, but very interesting, very a lot of uh, parallels that I'd be happy to talk about if there are uh, inter interested in the Q&A. But it's, this, it's only, this analogy really only goes so far and the insights from 2D dilaton gravity only go so far because it's not clear what this means in more general theories of gravity where ADS-CFT appears to suggest that two-dimensional, maybe three-dimensional gravity is special. Higher dimensional gravity does not appear that it's described by an ensemble. N equals four super Young mills is supposed to be dual to five dimensional quantum gravity in ADS. N equals four super Young mills is not an ensemble, it's a single theory. So if there's averaging happening, what is it averaging over? And if there isn't averaging happening, then what is the gravitational path integral actually calculating? And it's important to figure this out because this is how we get at information conservation in black hole information paradox. What I would argue is clear, a lot of things are not clear, but I would argue that there is one thing here which is clear. And that is that we have pinned down a key ingredient in the resolution of the information paradox. And that this key ingredient is the gravitational path integral. 
And we really would like to understand, and we must understand this a lot better than we currently do. We have to understand why it's dominated by correlated replicas, why these correlated replicas give rise to unitary evolution, what this contribution means for gravitational theory, for quantum gravity in general, and for the quantum extremal surface formula. So current state of the information paradox, we haven't solved it yet. Now, some questions that we should be asking ourselves. What entropy is the quantum extremal surface formula or the gravitational path integral calculating? But what I think is most important, how do we compute it directly from the formula minus trace rho log rho in the bulk? At the end of the day, we, would, we, we know, we expect that you can do a minus trace rho log rho calculation. We've sort of taken this roundabout quantum extremal surface prescription, but we would like at the end of the day to actually do a straight up one moment entropy calculation minus trace rho log rho. How do we do that in a way that gives us the unitarity? What does an observer outside the black hole actually measure? So if you could make arbitrarily accurate measurements and you had an arbitrarily good quantum computer, would you, upon feeding all these measurements into your computer, find a pure state or a mixed state? And another question that, of course, we should be asking is whether the gravitational path integral is doing some kind of an average. What is it doing an average over? How do we explain the correlated replicas if it's not doing an average? There have been a, a, a huge amount of activity trying to understand this better. And one of the most interesting questions, in my opinion, is where did Hawking go wrong? If you, the calculation that we did is sort of this, this roundabout calculation that is extremely valuable, but we haven't said, okay, this is what Hawking forgot to do. This is what Hawking messed up. This is what Hawking messed up. We've said, here's another way of doing the calculation that gives you the answer you want. But we have not said what you actually need to do to execute Hawking's calculation correctly and get a unitary entropy, a unitarily evolving entropy. And I think, again, that that is one of the most pressing and interesting problems that we, we need to be tackling. With. And so th this is my, my hypothesis is that uh, we'll all be thinking about these and working on these in the, in the coming uh, months, years maybe, and hopefully learning a lot more about quantum gravity in the process. So with that, I uh, will finish. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Neta, for this beautiful talk. So there is some question. May I ask a practical question? Sure. Of course. If you were to throw Trump into a black hole and the black hole evaporates, does he come out? <sighs> oh gosh, that is a practical question. Um, in a, in, a, in a very, in a scrambled form. <laughs> that's not unitary. Uh, that's not unitary if he comes out in a scrambled form. You mean because uh, information will be lost? <laughs> Assuming that there was any information in him. <laughs> Indeed, I, I, uh, I applaud. <laughs> okay, some other question, please. I have uh, some small basic questions, if you don't mind. They're very elementary, I think. I, I, um, if you could go to any slide, because I think you had many of them, with your formula for S row body equals area plus S row out. Yes. Uh, um, so I, I just had a question about this uh, bulk boundary correspondence. The density matrix in the bulk um, corresponds to a density matrix in the boundary, correct? Um, so we expect, so there's a, a it depends what you mean by corresponds to, but uh, why, why don't you ask the entire question and then I'll answer it. So, so, for, so I guess, for instance, um, if I started off with a pure state in the physical system that I'm working in, which is I have this like sphere of light um, centering towards some like central area, uh, central region, the black hole forms, the black hole evaporates, like this sort of scenario. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say the initial state of the system is uh, pure. Yeah. Right. So the initial system is zero entropy. Um, what is rho boundary? Does rho boundary have zero entropy as well at the beginning? Yes. So, oh. so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so if it has zero entropy at the beginning, maybe I misunderstood this um, page curve that you drew earlier. What entropy is increasing if 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 there's supposed to be unitary evolution and yes. the entropy of the boundary is zero and the entropy of the whole system is zero, I would never expect the entropy to increase at any point in time, anywhere. Right, so um, the, the, the 
quite the point is that you're you're not computing the entropy of the entire system for the, the entire duration of the of the of the calculation. So this is the um, the entropy of a part of the system, except so so event, basically the way you want to think about it is um, suppose that you have a, a box of of, uh, of gas and you have a partition in the box and essentially what you start out with the partition um, is all the way up to the the left wall of the box so that your system contains nothing in the box so it's obviously in a pure state and then you essentially you move the partition over. Um, and so it's, you, the entropy increases and it, keeps, it increases as you move the partition over, but eventually you move the partition so you include the entire system. And so at the end, you include the entire system, which is in a pure state, your entropy is zero again. So the, the point is that the entropy is allowed to increase during this process because in the middle, you're, you're only considering the part which is you know, to the left of the, of the partition. But by the time that you make the partition, the, the left, the, the, the partition include the entire box, then the left of it is the entire system, which is pure. So but that, what this entropy here is tracking is effectively exactly that. It's computing the entropy of the radiation. And initially, there is no radiation, so the entropy is zero. Uh, and finally, and at the end, finally, the entropy is the entire is the radiation is all of the radiation, which is the entire system at the end. And so its entropy is zero again. So it's completely analogous to the um, to, to the partition of the box. That you that you move from the left where it contains none of the box, not none of the state, to the right where eventually it contains the entire box. Does that make sense? I think so. So when you were saying the entropy here, you were talking about row out, S of row out, correct? Yes, exactly. Right. So then maybe I'm misunderstanding the formula. If if row boundary has entropy zero and area mm -hmm. has entropy zero, uh, uh, initially the the boundary is um, empty, so the area is zero, mm -hmm. and S of row out is initially zero. Um, is that formula valid for all time? Like, um, how, should I, how should I understand that formula as a function? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so I, I swept a couple of things under the rug here, um, which I think is, is what's causing the confusion. So um, here, what we, what we, so, okay, a couple of different ways of thinking about this that um, I think it would be helpful. Um, so here, so this formula, right, it computes um, row boundary, the, the, the Venom entropy of, of row boundary. But remember that we had to, um, we had to couple the, our ADS system to a cold bath in order to get it to evaporate. Which means that when I talk about row boundary here, I'm really talking about a, a part of the system for as long as the black hole is actually evaporating. Because my, by, but what we mean by putting a cold bath on the edge of ADS, on the bound of ADS, this means that we are coupling our CFT to another CFT so that it's an open system for the duration of the evaporation process. So we, so this, so that what I, um, so, he, so this, this, I've, I've kind of swept a little bit under the rug here, but, um, but the idea is you start out with, uh, with a certain value of the entropy, you couple your CFT to a CFT in the vacuum state. Which, which has you coupling, which has you putting a cold bath on the boundary of the black hole of the ADS space time. Then the black hole evaporates. There's interaction between the, the, your, your CFT and the, this other CFT and this, this, this reservoir. Um, so there's interaction between those two. And so row boundary does not, is not zero at every stage of the game either. Um, and this is, again, this is because we had to couple our black hole to an auxiliary system in order to get it to evaporate in the first place. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? I have a question. Big, big as a question. Oh, okay. Go on. I think there were two, I, I, but uh, whatever order. <laughs> go. Should I go? Yeah, go, Pepe. Thanks. So uh, you explained how this um, semi classical calculation of the page curve produces an answer which is difficult to interpret or that uh, produces uh, you know some some uh, uh, mysteries about how to interpret the path integral especially mm -hmm. with regard to the to the wormholes and you mentioned three possibilities that people has been uh, talking about uh, for the last couple of years or so but I don't think that you committed to any of them very clearly so I wanted to ask you about uh, yeah. Um, yeah. In this, in which sides of this tension between a standard ADS safety law and yeah. uh, uh, freedom in the gravitational path integral you would see? It. So, um, 
my i i am i lean towards um the poss the my my opinion is that there there are non perturbative corrections that restore factorization um in general of course in ads2 for gt gravity we do know that the path integral is literally computing on ensemble average and it might also be the case in 3d gravity but if we're talking about you know legitimately 40 45d gravity n equals 4 super yang mills um i i I suspect that there's there are non perturbative physics. Um, we we cannot expect, in my opinion, that the gravitational path integral in the saddle point approximation actually contains everything there is to know about the black hole evaporation process. And I think it's it's really good at calculating things. Um, the fact that it gives us the fact that there's these connected topologies that dominate, I think it's it, that is a smoking gun signal, in my opinion, that there is some additional features that quantum gravity really has to actually step in to take care of. So you can do the calculation in, in semi-classical gravity, but at the end of the day, if you really want to justify it, I think you do need to have access to the more fine-grained um, information about the state, which you can only really get from non-perturbative quantum gravity. Now, I, I say this for various philosophical reasons that I just explained, but I don't have evidence that, that this is the correct, uh, the correct way to go. That this is definitely how things get resolved. Mm -hmm. Okay, Herman. Yes, uh, well, very nice talk, by the way. So I, I would like to ask, uh, so the, in a way, I mean, you are uh, claiming that you saw the information paradox, right? You see this, doing this computation uh, based on the replica trick, right? Uh, Sorry, can you then, just repeat that one more time? Uh, no, I mean, you are, the two, technical tool is the replica trick to compute the entropy, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, well, in quantum field theory, it, it, this is a trick, indeed. <laughs> that sure, we don't yeah. Much physical yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, seems that you are, it seems that you are trying to get more in physical insight from this trick or this replica. Is that mm -hmm. the case? This is what uh, I understood. Oh. Yeah, so, so definitely. So we, we, we use the replica trick, the, the so-called gravitational replica trick, which is just the gravitational interpretation of the regular replica trick. And, um, and, and yeah, we get something which is more insightful, I think, than we were expecting to get in terms of it tell, telling us something about the gravitational path integral. Now, as I think I mentioned in my last slide, um, let me just go there. So um, I think that we would get a lot more insight if we could, as I say in this first bullet point here, if we could do the calculation directly from the formula minus trace row on row without using the replica trick, which as you say, is just a trick. The fact that the replica trick has already taught us a lot or it told us where to look is very uh, it's very hopeful. It means that even simple things like you know this this little trick can do a lot for us. But um, mm -hmm. it is true that at the end of the day, I think we will have to confront the fact that there is a formula and we should be calculating things ideally not from this trick but from the formula directly. Uh -huh. So you are also assuming holography, right? I mean, this derivation relies also on in holography. Uh, so the derivation, the derivation doesn't rely on holography in the sense that it relies only on um, on the gravitational path integral. So if you're if you're willing to work with the gravitational path integral, you don't actually have to invoke holography here. Now I view holography as a really good um, justification for the validity of the calculations done by the gravitational path integral. But of course, um, you can look at Gibbons Hawking, you know, use gravitational path integral long before uh, it was holography to, to basically they're doing the similar calculation. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, may I also ask a, a couple of questions? So, of uh, how is that uh, having these uh, uh, boundary conditions that uh, let uh, uh, get away part of the radiation? Relate to these uh, to these uh, geometries that uh, connect different copies in the replica trick. Ah, uh, good. I, unfortunately, this is not one of the talks where I had a picture of how that looks. But um, so the the when you do the replica trick and um, in these so so let's, let's work with JT gravity, and um, so the the so we have some um, so in the Lorentzian picture 
we have some so some two-sided uh, ADS black hole, and we have this time-like boundary, and then we have uh, and then we couple uh, one or both boundaries to a um, to a cold uh, to a CFT in a vacuum state. So we have you know the the null boundaries, and then we have the um, the time-like asymptotic boundary. So this is a Lorentzian picture. Now, um, if we want to do this replica trick calculation, we normally want to work in Euclidean signature. Recently, there was a paper doing this in Lorentzian signature, um, the schrodinger keldish contour. So, so we work in, in the in, in the um, in the Euclidean picture, where essentially where the ADS boundary just becomes a, a, a circle, and um, but you still have the auxiliary in the bath outside of it. So that, that was just Minkowski space, and it's just R R two Minkowski space in Euclidean signature. And so the so the way that the that you do this is uh, you, you basically look at some um, some interval in the bath. So you want to compute the entropy of some subset of the bath, or maybe the whole bath. And you, so what happens, so the replicas are all uh, identified. The end replicas are identified along this interval in the bath. And so they're all, they're identified there. And so you put you basically put a cut there. You cyclically identify all of the replicas um, as uh, along this cut, which is the, the bath interval that you're looking to, whose entropy you're looking to compute. But this is all in the non-gravitational region. Which means that so you, really you think you're thinking you can think of this as doing two path integrals. One is a quantum field theory path integral, and one is a gravitational path integral, which is uh, which is the uh, which fills in the ADS boundary. So basically, you have this R four, uh, this is R two, with a circle in the middle which is empty, and you have n copies of that that are all identified along some cut in the R two region, and the gravitational path integral is then asked to fill in the um, the ADS two boundary, the circle. Uh, or n, n copies of the circle. And, you, and and of course, what they find is that the way it wants to fill it in after the page time is with these connected topologies. Does that answer your question? Okay. I, I, I mean, if, I, if I had pictures, it would be easier. <laughs> I think I will have to read it. So another question is, uh, yeah, more sort of philosophical is, um, you get some intuition then how manage information to escape from these considerations? Uh, no, you know, this is a, a really excellent question and one which I, I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, and I think it, it did, it is, um, where did they put this? somewhere here, I thought I put it. Um, oh yeah, so what does an observer outside the black hole actually measure? Um, how, I mean, we, it, we think information escapes, but how does it escape? Um, you know, I don't know. And I think this is something that uh, we, one of these four bullet points well, maybe not the third one, but either the first, second, or the fourth will have to be answered for us to be able to, to know that. For example, where did Hawking go wrong, I think is critical to understand how the information actually gets out. Because and that's a semi-classical calculation that, that gives us, that appears to give us no leeway with how the information gets out. We could use a different way of calculating the entropy, but if you're an observer standing outside the black hole making measurements, you're only making, the, the, the measurements you make are clear. And so the question is what, yeah, um, so, somehow it will look that uh, as far as what is escaping is thermal radiation, and I don't know if in this uh, uh, holographic picture uh, mm -hmm. there is something else than that. Uh, it's hard to see that. Uh, oh, so yeah. So okay. So I, right, okay. I think I slightly misunderstood the question. So from the holographic picture, um, we can do we we can do bulk reconstruction on the. Um, on the basically on the interior using the radiation that escaped. Uh, so you can use the, this patch map style reconstruction, which allows you to reconstruct the, uh, basically allows you to, to, to decode the Hawking radiation, if you like. Um, now the, the, the problem, so this, this uses the duality uh, as opposed to an observer who's actually just sitting inside the, in, in the bulk and floating around and making observations. This uses really an observer who's in the, in the non-gravitational system. Um, but one, maybe one insight we can gain from it is the, the, the level of complexity of the reconstruction procedure. Mm -hmm. Very high complexity. Uh, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry, what was that? No, uh, there is, in quantum information, there is this no hiding theorem that in, in evolution, you cannot hide the information. I mean, you can scramble somewhere, else, but they appear somewhere else. So maybe it, this plays a role in this game, right? Uh, I don't know if this must play a role, probably, right? 
I mean, it's, 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 cer it's certainly relevant uh, in the sense that we, we, we want the information to get out. But I think I think as Bronson is asking, how uh, how does it do that? Um, yeah. And I, I yeah, I mean, I, I suspect. That, I mean, if we if we're going to go based off of le lessons from the both reconstruction picture using the pets map um, and the, the the Python's lunch story about the complexity of operators, you know, in the in the region that's described by the radiation, or the region of the black hole that, that, that's described by the radiation or entangled with the radiation. Um, I think one of the things that we are learning is that it's extreme, it's very high complexity, high computational complexity. And so the, the cost, the computational cost to extracting that information is very high. Now, um, what does that mean? But how do we actually extract it? Again, for an observer who's actually sitting in the bulk, I don't know. But um, it, it's certainly if there's this intuition that semi-classical gravity describes um, simple computational experiments very well, and quantum gravity describes high complexity um, high complexity experiments or high complexity physics, uh, then we could we could say okay, well there has to be some quantum gravity process that by which the information gets out. That's not really that useful insofar as you kind of suspect that this is what happens in the first place. But the fact that there's some kind of a separation between simple and complex operations and computation, simple and complex operators, uh, might help us figure out what is the what the process involved is. I, I, the, the short answer is I don't know. The long answer is I have some big ideas. <laughs> okay, I can can do just a last a extremely naive uh, question that uh, I I'm a bit confused by the role of this. Uh, of these open boundary conditions of this additional system where radiation can go. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if radiation is escaping, then it's clear that the entropy is going to, well, it, it can decrease. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there must be, uh, you know, somehow you want to recover that the state is uh, pure without letting anything escape. And I'm a bit confused. Right. So, so what you what you're really doing here, you, you're is you're, you're you can imagine you're basically by hand extracting the radiation and you're keeping it in an external reservoir. So that means that you can you, you can basically think of uh, the radiation is not escaping and then you can't have control over it. It's escaping. You're keeping it and you're computing its entropy as a function of time. So as a function of you you know picking out more and more of the Hawking pairs as you pick them out. You compute the, you know, you keep on computing the entropy of this growing system, and if you do the naive calculation minus trace mo log rho, which we did, then you find that the the, the entropy just keeps on uh, increasing and actually violates a rocky lead. But um, which one of us would expect the violation violation of unitarity? But if you use the quantum extremal surface prescription to compute the entropy of this uh, of the radiation, then again you're keeping it in this external reservoir. So if you start with the CFT in its ground state. And then everything that is uh, that, that changes is a consequence of you basically taking the Hawking pairs and putting it in the CFT in the ground state. Um, and so what what uh, what you find is that the if you use a quantum extremal surface prescription is that the entropy actually um, actually goes up and then it comes back down again. So that the the radiation somehow uh, purifies itself. But it, so it, but it's not that you're just kind of letting it escape to infinity and then you're forgetting about it. You're you're keeping it and you're computing its entropy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, some more question? Okay, Actually, then. I have a, sorry, it's been a, uh, I do have a question. It's, it's very uh, simple, actually. So we do observe now horizons of black holes. No, we don't. We don't. Well, uh, it's impossible we observe to observe the, the horizon of a black hole. <laughs> okay, we see the gas that seems to be circling the horizon of a black hole in the Event Horizon Telescope, and we observe how that gas leaves some light that reaches us, right? Mm -hmm. So indirectly, we are seeing, okay, we have seen the shadow, if you want, of a black hole, but we've seen the behavior of matter near those uh, horizons. My question is, do you have any way that uh, the information which uh, you seem to uh, extract from that black hole, from the evaporation, leave some imprint in the uh, signals that we can observe from those black holes? Um, so, I mean, if we're talking about something like M87, its temperature is what was it about 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin. Right. Um, so it's not it's not evaporating. Um, if we no, it, you, you could it is it, it's emitting radiation, but it's sort of absorbing more than it's emitting. 
Sure. Uh, but I think that doesn't really answer your question because uh, your, your question is, is more, if I understand correctly, more along the lines of uh, suppose we could actually observe uh, one of these black holes evaporate somehow. Exactly. Uh, Imagine a much smaller black hole than yeah. we managed to observe. Yeah. Right, right. Um, which, which, of course, is, is, is a fascinating question. And one of it maybe, I mean, it, it's, it's not impossible that some radiation that we see in the universe today actually came from evaporating black holes. How do we, how do we tell? Mm -hmm. um, I think the the this is extremely fine tuned in the sense so with my it's not fine tuned sorry fine grained information. Um, I don't know on a practical level if um, we have enough control over an astrophysical system that interacts so much with all of its surroundings to be able to extract empirical data that would be helpful in guiding us specifically towards resolving the information paradox. Um, that said, if we could actually observe a black hole evaporating and we could see, you know, look at the spectrum and see if there are any deviation from, deviation from thermality, anything at all that we can see from an evaporating black hole, if we could observe something like that, I'm sure would be helpful. It's just actually, you know, actually computing the purity of the state is uh, for an astrophysical black hole, I just, um, in principle, you could imagine doing it uh, by basically making arbitrarily good measurements, having an arbitrarily good quantum computer. But I think on a practical level, um, I suspect that if we, can, if, if we can observe evaporating black holes, that is not the aspect that will be valuable for us. And it will be more in understanding, in observing the process, the time scales, the, uh, the, the sort of the, the spectrum of the, of the radiation to the extent that we can resolve it. Okay, I, I don't, let, yeah. sorry, let me uh, interrupt you. Let, let me rephrase the question. Imagine yeah. now that you measure gravitational waves from the fusion of two black holes. Mm -hmm. Is the nature, the quantum nature of those black holes going to be seen in something which is emitted in those gravitational waves? For instance, on, from the ring down phase, somehow yeah. are we going to see the way those uh, quantum structure mm -hmm. of those black holes actually uh, leave some imprint in something that we can ever observe? In principle, yes, not with our current gravitational wave detectors. Sure. Um, I I can potential, I mean, so I haven't crunched the numbers. Um, I think it's not just crunching numbers. I mean, you have to do some pretty serious analysis, but it's not, I would say it's not impossible that maybe with next generation gravitational wave detectors, we could start asking these questions. Okay, so it's something like normal mode? Uh, maybe like the quasi-normal mode. Quasi-normal uh, mode. Something in yeah potentially something that if we if we could really resolve details of the ring down, mm -hmm. um, and in in you know maybe at the very end, um, possibly you know aspects of memory effect. Um, there are various different small effects that we might be able to to look at. Um, I don't know if the numbers would work out, but I think it's not a priori impossible that the next next generation gravitational wave detectors like LISA maybe could be sensitive to that kind of thing. If, if they really knew how to tune, like if we were to able to give very precise predictions so that they would be, they were able to really tune the instrument to detect that, I think it could easily get washed out if you wouldn't know what you're looking for. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right approach. Okay. Uh, some last question. Okay, then uh, let's, well, Neta, thank you very much for, for this uh, very nice talk and uh, really fascinating topic. So, okay, thank you very much. And thank you for having we, me. We close the session uh, for today and uh, so see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Neta. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes.